Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick. You, I just introduced myself. Um, I work on the faculty at the University of Chicago in the Department of Computer Science. Um, also uh, help lead the Data Science Institute. Uh, Mark, also, uh, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, so I, uh, Mark Richardson, I'm a technical project manager with the initiative, and I work closely with Nick and some of our researchers on a lot of different projects, which we'll hear some about today. So uh, I just want to say thanks for having us. I think we're, we're you know, longtime fans of Chai Hack Night. Did I say it right? Longtime listener, first time caller. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we're here to tell you about the Internet Equity Initiative. Uh, there's a URL. Uh, this, this data portal just launched uh, yesterday. And we'll tell you about some of the things that we've been doing with uh, internet data across the city. Uh, as the name would suggest, the project has to do with equity. We'll talk about exactly what's going on with that and some of the interesting things we've found so far. Uh, but I think uh, one of the reasons we're here is that um, there's a lot of work to do. And we hope to excite all of you uh, about, about this important problem in our city. I think that's the other thing I'll mention too is that it should become pretty apparent that we, to, over the last couple of years, we have focused our efforts on Chicago. Uh, this obviously is a much gen more general problem. Uh, but uh, as you'll see, um, it's a problem right here in our, in our own neighborhoods and backyard. Uh, so you can see there are uh, a bunch of folks involved. Uh, we would love it if, if you would be one of them. <laughs> um, and at the end, we'll talk about different ways to get involved. Um, so I think, uh, well, we're here in person, thankfully. Super excited. I know this event's been going on online for quite some time. Uh, and I think if, if, you know, I think if you've been around for the past couple of years, it should be no secret that in, the access to the internet is a prerequisite for uh, participating in life these days. Uh, affordable, reliable, uh, high-speed internet access has downstream effects on just about everything we do in life from taking classes to seeing the doctor to finding jobs to doing our jobs uh, and so forth. Which basically means uh, if you don't have access to the internet, you are at a, at a severe disadvantage in, in today's society. And I think um, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly been uh, known of in, in, in the abstract and in the small, I think, for a while that uh, communities that are underserved uh, in general uh, for all types of infrastructure are also underserved for the internet. <laughs> and so what we are trying to do in this project is put a finer point on that, shed a lens on that. Uh, and I think um, there are a number of reasons that we want to do that. But uh, just to put a really fine point on it, um, if you saw yesterday, the Biden administration uh, announced some, some new initiatives around uh, affordable connectivity program, et cetera. The, the government has decided that they're going to throw a lot of money behind this, uh, tens of billions of dollars. And who gets the money is going to be formula-based, and it's going to be based on demonstrated need, okay? Which means that in order to, long, that's a fancy way of saying, uh, in order to get the money, you have to demonstrate that you need it. <laughs> How are you going to demonstrate that you need it? You basically need to show that you don't have a, a reliable, affordable internet access. Um, well, just like many problems, uh, the, the, the communities and neighborhoods, the groups that are most underserved, actually have the least data about them. And so demonstrating that need actually is, is, is what, we're really, um, what we're really trying to, to advance here. Now, um, this is not a new problem. Okay, I think basically the digital divide has been around uh, as long as digital. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly uh, there are a number of spins that, that we've seen on this. I think one you might hear at some point is called the homework gap. Uh, and that basically is, is kind of what it sounds like, which is that um, stu uh, students, in order to complete homework, basically need access to the Internet at home. And if you, you, you know, search this phrase online, you'll read lots of, uh, I'll say, horror stories of uh, school-aged children d driving up to parking lots, backing up to coffee shops and shopping malls, et cetera, to uh, snarf free Wi-Fi so that they can actually do their homework. So um, uh, it's, it's been, been quite a problem. Um, <clears throat> this slide actually, um, I should mention, 
one of our collaborators, uh, Nicole Marwell, uh, in, uh, reminded me that this slide is a little bit dated now. This is about, uh, this, these are statistics from about two years ago. Um, uh, but you can see that basically there's, uh, you know, certainly uh, has been a problem here uh, in, in various Chicago neighborhoods. Um, this program that's referenced here at the, in the bottom left, Chicago Connected, you might have heard about it. It's a subsidy program uh, that actually has had some success in getting uh, some families who otherwise couldn't afford internet access signed up for uh, free, free, uh, for free or subsidized internet access, and that um, uh, that was offered to uh, CPS uh, school children who were who were eligible. Um, <clears throat> one of the things uh, that I think uh, we I think we'll try to drive home today is that um, this map over here on the far left, uh, sorry, on the far right, it's shaded in such a way, kind of familiar, right? I've sort of given the spoiler. Uh, in the in the in the arrow in the text down there with the pointers, but um, you know if, uh, sometimes I ask people what they think this shows, and you know uh, it's a talk about internet speeds, uh, and often people say, well, it must be a map about internet speeds, fast speeds on the north, slow speeds on the south, right, and west. Well, it's actually that's probably true <laughs> if you were to take the take the measurements. Uh, that's what we're trying to get a handle on. But this map's actually a little bit something different. Anybody run speed test before, like speedtest.net? So this is basically the, amount, the number of tests that are being run across the city in different neighborhoods of, of, from speedtest.net. So basically, uh, people who live in wealthy neighborhoods run speed test. <laughs> um, uh, people who, who live elsewhere tend to, to not. The implications of that are severe, right? Because if you want to talk about uh, digital divide or homework gap or any of those things in in the south and west sides of our city well there's actually no data to even talk about it you can you can you can talk about it in the abstract you could talk about anecdotes but in order to remember when I said at the beginning the federal the, the federal investment in order to basically get that you need to demonstrate that you have a problem um, <clears throat> I think just backing up of course too I think this is good news in a way right I mean you know, the pandemic did bring some good news for us that everybody thought, oh, everybody's going to go home and start Zooming and the Internet's going to melt down, right? <laughs> and thankfully, it, it didn't. Um, but uh, I think it, be, it, it shed light on where the, where the actual problems were, right? In, in, in some sense, we don't have, you know, the technical infrastructure problems that everybody was concerned about, like the sky's going to fall, the Internet's going to melt down. That just didn't happen. But I think what we did see is that some of these other uh, more social uh, problems have really uh, been amplified. This is the, uh, the commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission talking about exactly that problem. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, e e there is money being thrown at this problem. That's finally, right? I think it took maybe the pandemic for uh, policymakers, et cetera, to realize like, oh, wait, this actually is a problem. Uh, so that's good because I think for a long time, many people have been banging the drum to say, no, 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 we have a problem here. We have a problem here. Now, I think it's become very clear that there is a problem. Uh, that even the, the bad data sample that I showed you right before, that's often enough to, to demonstrate that there is a problem. But now, if we're sort of, you know, agreed that there is a problem, uh, the next step is to, f well, how do we fix it? And, and, and that's where we're just really lacking data. Like, where are the problems? Like, turns out it's really local. It's block to block. Um, you know, what's the cause of it? Is it actually uh, Comcast or AT&T or RCN's fault? Uh, or is it your Wi-Fi router, right? Or is it some other something? Is it the fact that you, whatever internet service plan you've signed up for, you've got 10 people connected to it, and, you know, um, and, and that's the problem. All kinds of all kinds of challenges uh, that we're trying to to get to the bottom of. So, as I mentioned, uh, the investment is happening, but but we really got to sort of figure out how to how to drive that. And so that's essentially where I think this project uh, comes in. And I think this this slide is from about a year ago, uh, and I think it's great because I talked about this about a year ago and. Basically, as of like yesterday, a lot of the a lot of the things that we've discussed on this slide or sort of promised are becoming reality. There are public maps. There's a data portal. You can see it at that URL that I presented. Um, there are data sets to to poke around with. There are more. 
Um, if you want more data and it's not available on the site, talk to me or Mark. I'm sure we can we can we can get you uh, more data um, of of certain types. We'll talk about some of the some of the ways that we're getting better data, um, and also we're developing software to to get better data, better better measurements about all kinds of things from everything from like where are the cell towers to how fast is that person's internet to is it fast enough to actually support uh, this Zoom session, for example, or YouTube. So. Why this is such an interesting problem, I think, is you know a challenging problem is that um, you know there's a lot of technical aspects to it. Like there's the you know uh, how how fast is the connection, and that's that's sort of a classic like how how fast can we push bits through the network? Um, but also like as I mentioned, where are the cell towers. That's actually a problem that involves like going around and you know you know applying computer vision to Google Street View and other 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 things like that to kind of moving up to the human layers, right? Like, well, is this Zoom call actually good enough for me to use? And so that's a really interesting user experience kind of question. And then there's some other uh, issues that I probably won't get into as much today, but figuring out exactly as we think about like ways to solve this problem, some really interesting ways that solutions integrate with the social uh, and community fabric, right? Because we can talk about like digging a trench or we can talk about putting up a radio in a neighborhood and like, you know, beaming it that way. And then getting it into a building, there's all kinds of interesting issues with who runs that and how do you, do you have people sign up individually or do you work through a property manager and so on and so forth. And that's not what today is about, but I think this is a really interesting, uh, interesting area because you really have to consider the whole, the whole piece of the puzzle. Um, where we kind of started, and I think, I think this is probably, uh, we hope, kind of aligned with the ethos of of Chai Hack Night, which is like, we don't just like take the data and then like dream up the questions, right? We started with uh, talking to uh, some stakeholders. In this case, <coughs> uh, one of the stakeholders is the city themselves. And they're really quite interested in a variety of questions. One of them, you know, was like, well, how fast does the internet really need to be to support a Zoom call? Uh, and so we did a bunch of work on that. Another one that I think we'll we'll talk a little bit about at the end is like is the one that was uh, you know featured in the, in the news yesterday about like well which neighborhoods basically have better or worse adoption uh, according to the census data and we worked with the city to do some analysis of the census data to to get that um, okay so step one was really like let's go to the stakeholders let's figure out what they really want to know so that we can we can serve them better uh, and then it turns out like you know. Other things, uh, th you know, once this question, once these questions are sort of teed up, we have to think about well, how are we going to get the data to basically help uh, the stakeholders really get those questions answered? And one of the things that we, you know, that I think has been known for a while, but we really encounter is that, like, unfortunately, a lot of the tools out there to to take speed test measurements, um, well, some of them I should say, don't produce great uh, measurements. Unfortunately, the one that you get when you search speed test on Google is actually not great. Um, talks too short today to, to, to get into it, but, but the data, I think in, in this group, I probably don't need to sort of belabor the fact that data quality, right, is a, big, is a big concern. If you have dirty data, if you have data that's being produced by buggy tools, then your analysis is just gonna be garbage all the way down. Um, and so we've spent a fair bit of time like fixing the tools. Uh, and one of the things that uh, this project has produced is actually a toolkit to produce better measurements of network, of network performance from people's homes. Um, this is an open source project on, on GitHub. You can find it uh, from internetequity.uchicago.edu. Uh, and it has a suite of performance tests. Uh, and as we're working on it, uh, ways to integrate new kinds of performance tests as well. Um, the lighting's a little tricky in here, but you, this is an example of some of the data that, that it produces. Um, everything from speed tests to, uh, oh, is it the next slide? Yeah, <laughs> it's a little bit better. It's bigger anyway. You know, how fast is, you know, what's my downstream connection? How fast can I move bits into the home? How fast can I move them out? Um, you know, how, how, what's the latency? So if you're gamer, ping time, things like that, right? So uh, things of that nature. Um, some things that I think uh, were, you know, we had to consider very carefully and long and hard in the project were like, uh, well, what, what are things we'd like to know? What are things data could tell us versus what can we reasonably get? And I, I'll tell you one place where we've drawn a line right now is uh, looking at things like how, how, how's the YouTube performance? How's the Zoom performance, et cetera? Well, in order to figure that out, you actually have to like 
um, I'll just call it, you know, for the, for the sake of simplifying the discussion, you kind of have to wiretap, right? You have to get in there and basically sniff the traffic because you can say, oh, there's a YouTube session. Well, now let me see like how, you know, what speed that connection is coming in or going out at. And so that's a, that's a challenging problem. But importantly, it's also like a potentially very privacy invasive problem because, you know, okay, suddenly we know someone's watching YouTube or someone we know someone's watching Netflix. And maybe we don't know what they're watching. But again, consider the communities that, w that, that, we're, that we're trying to get to, to work with here already you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, um, trust issues and other things that we have to grapple with. And, you know, it's, you can imagine the difficulties there, even if we weren't looking at it to basically say, oh, trust us. No, it's fine. We're going to basically, we'll, we'll see that you're looking at YouTube, but we won't see what you're looking at. Trust us, right? So we just decided not to go there. So I think that's, that, that, was, an, that was a decision we made. Another, another, dis, another reason we didn't go there is that, um, if you're not into networking, I'm gonna just gloss over this, but if you are, you might recognize this. And so basically in order to get that kind of like wiretap, you really have to get in the middle of where the Wi-Fi router and the, and the cable modem is, and that's technically kind of complicated. So a lot of stuff that we could have gotten that, that, that might have been useful um, that we just decided not to get. I'm not gonna walk you through this slide, but this is just to illustrate. We went through like a pretty long detailed design process to sort of consider these trade-offs of like, well, what are things the city would like to know? What are things other stakeholders would like to know? What can we reasonably get uh, technically and also with respect for, for users? Okay, so at that, um, you wanna take it from here? Yeah, I'll take it. Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, so as we were uh, mentioning earlier, so one of the kind of main limitations of existing data sets is this um, lack of sufficient sampling of certain neighborhoods. Right, and this is a pretty big issue because um, this goes beyond simple just like technical methodology uh, to questions of proper sampling. Um, and existing network measurement approaches are usually based on what you can call convenience sampling or crowdsource sampling. Um, and this is, can be very different from like the actual demographics of a population that you're sampling. Um, <clears throat> and so what we've seen is that a lot of times state-of-the-art distributed measurements and even like FCC samples are systematically uh, blind to marginalized populations who either don't re run speed tests or do not sign up to volunteer for FCC measurements. Um, so with our platform, what we're trying to do is be a little more thoughtful with that sampling and try to uh, do the hard work of like going out and, and really, you know, engaging in the, the communities where we're trying to collect these measurements. Um, so a couple of maps here, I can, can kind of go through this quickly because uh, Nick already showed some of these maps on here, but um, essentially, you know, we can see just from a geographical distribution of some of the speed tests that there's just not sufficient representation in certain areas. And so when you don't have any data there, you can't really say anything about what's going on with the internet in those communities. And I think this is really important because especially when policy is starting to increasingly rely on data to, make, to inform decisions about where investments are going to be made of scarce public funds, the implications of being left out of the data are massive and threaten to marginalize communities that are already struggling. So we think that it's really important to focus on this. And here's another slide. I'll, I can go through this quickly, but this is just kind of showing, oh, sorry, <laughs> got to sync up here. Uh, this is just showing like a distribution of the census um, and the two popular speed tests, uh, speed test data sets, UCLA and Sam Knows. And you can see from this, these charts that basically the underlying distribution of, of here we're showing medium household income is extremely skewed towards the upper end of the distribution for both UCLA and Sam Knows. And actually with Sam knows it's even worse because we don't even have to do a fancy statistical analysis to show this. You can just look up. They don't have a single device in Chicago that measures anything. So can't really say a lot from these data sets. So what we're trying to do with our study, um, again, you can read about our study on the portal, um, is we're trying to be very kind of uh, systematic and rigorous about the sampling that we're doing. And right now what we've done is we've started out with kind of an initial deployment where we sent out um, Raspberry Pis that have the software Nick was talking about installed on them. And we send these to participants who sign up for the study. 
and then they plug it into their router and it starts measuring you know a variety of different network measurements. Um, so we've started with an initial deployment broadly across Chicago, and then we've kind of honed in on three primary neighborhoods, uh, Inglewood, South Shore, and Logan Square. And our community project manager, Grace Chu, who's not here with us tonight, has been working closely with uh, community organizations in these neighborhoods to directly engage the residents and talk to them and try to get them to uh, you know, understand the importance of what we're trying to do and, and ask for their help in, in closing the gaps that we see in the existing data sets. Um, so here's a map of where we have our existing deployments right now. These are not all active deployments right now, but these are the deployments we've made since the beginning of the study in October 2021. Um, we have about 30 or so community areas represented with at least one device deployed. Um, you can see that we've made some pretty good progress in South Shore. Um, we have about 16 devices there. Uh, Logan Square, we have about six devices. So we're trying to push these numbers up, really engage with the residents there. Um, and I'm happy to say that at the end of next week, I think we'll have about 10 more devices in South Shore and almost 15 more devices in Logan Square. So, and our goal is to really kind of get this number up to about 100 devices by fall into the year um, with 25 deployments in each neighborhood and then like kind of a base of 25 distributed across Chicago. Um, and the important part of this is that, you know, by really like thoroughly sampling these areas, we can get a much better sense of what the internet performance is like across a geography like the neighborhood. Um, and that allows us to start doing like really, you know, rigorous studies of comparing like, okay, in Logan Square, where we kind of think the internet is a little bit better, the, the infrastructure is better provisioned, how does that compare to a place like South Shore? How does that compare to a place like Inglewood? Um, and so kind of the, the main thing that we're focused on, right, is that we want to collect this data, we want to do good research, but we also want to translate that research into social impact. And we understand that most people are not just looking to read another research paper. So we're really trying to focus on, you know, how can we take that and turn it into actionable insights, solutions, and impact that communities can actually take and run with. And one kind of area that we're really trying to do that is with the portal itself. So the portal is right now kind of in its main, uh, its I'd like to say like prototype phase. Um, what we are trying to do with the portal is basically take a data first approach rather than a map first approach, which if you've seen any broadband portals, a lot of them do that where they just kind of stick a map up there and they're like, all right, here's a map. And what we're trying to do is like take the data and make it like easier, more accessible, lower the barriers for people that are working in this space so that they can really start to like dig into the data and use it to support their own agendas. One way we're trying to do that is through what we're calling data stories. And data stories are kind of supposed to be approachable, accessible pieces of analysis that answer a very simple question that someone might have about internet equity. So one, of, one example of that is we have a data story up on the portal right now. It's titled The Tale of Two Gigs. And basically what we did is we took two households, one in Hyde Park, one in South Shore, and we deployed our devices in those households. And we just started measuring their network for about two months. And the interesting thing about this is that these two households are both subscribed to the exact same internet service provider, and they both pay for the exact same internet service. And what I'm showing here in this graph is that you can see this is the, the download uh, throughput for both houses. And you can clearly see the South Shore household continuously over the course of the two months we are measuring is clocking about 100 megabits per second less than the Hyde Park household. So we saw this at first and we we're kind of like, what is going on here? Why is there two different performance, why are we seeing performance differences between two households that are pretty much similarly situated just One's in South Shore, one's in Hyde Park. And so we actually digged a little bit more into this data, and you can see here's another um, latency measure that we collect. You can see the same pretty stark difference, trends that are pretty different. Um, 
And this is actually the case across a, a variety of different measurements that we took for both these households. And you can see uh, in this, this, box part, this box plot chart here that basically we see a performance difference, a meaningful performance difference across a variety of metrics. So, you know, that brings us to kind of the more difficult question, which is why do we see this difference? And the reason that's so difficult is because the internet is a very vast infrastructure. There's a lot of different components, a lot of different moving parts. Um, so there can be, you know, a lot of breakdowns in the, the infrastructure from the device that's connecting to the internet to the actual, like, content provider like YouTube and Instagram. And, you know, this really kind of emphasizes the importance of the data that we're collecting because we, in order to, like, really study this question, we need to have a lot more, you know, a, a lot bigger sample size than an N of two. And... Um, in order to be able to really like rigorously study. And I, we think that with enough data and enough like, um, you know, careful sampling, we'll be able to actually start to tease apart some of these questions and start to better understand why the internet is not performing the same in two different neighborhoods. Sorry, and we have some other questions that we've answered on the portal as well, um, such as how does internet adoption vary? and what speeds are necessary. This is the, the uh, work with the city that Nick mentioned it earlier. So just a couple, a couple more minutes. Um, so um, there's a couple of other, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, um, this, the you know, questions about internet equity uh, really go from applications all the way down to infrastructure. And uh, you know, as we think about uh, you know, both mapping e these inequities uh, as well as figuring out uh, solutions, it's helpful to know where the existing infrastructure is. Um, and you can imagine uh, that things like physical infrastructure, uh, it's helpful to know where, that, you know, the, where the fiber's in the ground, it's helpful to know where the cell towers are, et cetera. And uh, you'd be surprised at, um, you, at the lack of holistic information on that. And so uh, that's a project that's, that's ongoing. Uh, there's a researcher in our group, Tarun Mangla, who's actually been using um, data from the uh, City of Chicago data portal for the, the dig permit data. Uh, so as it turns out, like there's a lot of information in that public data about permits for digging trenches to put fiber in the ground. And um, he's been using that data as the primary source to try to map out uh, our city's fiber infrastructure. Uh, there's a, he's also doing that for uh, cell towers. Uh, as well, because a, lo a lot of information from the permit data uh, is available. Uh, as you can see, there's there's other ways you can get it, <laughs> um, uh, and and so so uh, this is this is an interesting interesting challenge as well. Uh, another thing I'll mention, and this is uh, I think on the on the opening slide, there, in, in the last slide, you'll see a reference to some of our partners. Uh, one of our partners is uh, the Chicago Area Broadband Initiative, uh, which is. Um, headed by Dwayne Douglas, and uh, uh, it's, it, it's a, it, uh, he, they work on a number of things. One, as I alluded to at the beginning of our uh, talk, was uh, essentially wiring up multiple unit uh, dwellings um, and, and, and distributing an inter internet access to, uh, to tenants uh, by virtue of building wide connectivity, working through property owners. Um, uh, Long story short is there's a number of ways to wire up a building <laughs> um, from, you know, where the access is coming down the street through the trench to, uh, to a 5G tower uh, to uh, other things that are just literally being rolled off the shelf now. And so, um, and it's, a, it's, a question, it's, it's an interesting question because there are technical questions about what are the capabilities of this technology. Like how well does that radio uh, push data? How you know how reliable is it? Um, you know how does it how well does it work in weather? <laughs> how well does it work through brick walls, uh, et cetera? But there's also, uh, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, some social dynamics and community oriented and policy oriented questions there as well about how this kind of infrastructure is sustained and governed, uh, and upgraded and so forth. Um, and so we're um, just getting started on this part of the project. But the picture that you can see here, uh, I don't know if you recognize that building. You probably don't, but it's, uh, it's Overton uh, Elementary School. If you know anything about the history of Overton Elementary School, you know that it's closed. Um, it's down at 49th and Prairie. 
the Chicago Area Broadband Initiative has been working with partners down there um, to use this as a community center. One of the things they're doing in that, in that building is to set up uh, essentially uh, emulated environments so that they can evaluate how different wireless access technologies, other internet access technologies would work in a six flat or a two flat or a, any kind of uh, dwelling. So then the, when they go out to deploy this, they have a better idea of how the technology is actually going to work. So uh, we've begun some partnerships with the Chicago Area Broadband Initiative on that aspect. Uh, finally, I'll say there's a number of ways that I think uh, you can get involved. Um, you probably saw uh, on, on, this, on this slide that there aren't very many of us, <laughs> um, and there's a lot of work to do. And so uh, I think uh, Mark gave a really good summary of some of the data analysis that we've done so far, but there's actually more data uh, than, than, than we alluded to here. Uh, and really, we have not had a chance to look at all the data that, that, that we're gathering. Uh, and we hope to get more, as Mark said, as we, as we sort of build that deployment into other neighborhoods. There's just going to be more and more data. And so we, have a, we certainly have a data analysis problem. Um, it's a good problem to have. Uh, I mentioned, of course, that the, that the measurement techniques, et cetera, involve software that we have developed in-house because uh, as we looked at existing technologies to do this, turns out they're not actually producing great data. And so there's actually really interesting work to be done on the data acquisition side. As I mentioned, the, the techniques we've built there are open source. And then I think if, you know, as I think we've been talking about throughout the talk, you know, this is not just a, you know, uh, a tech project, right? This is not just a measurement project. Ultimately, this only matters if we can tell the story to the decision makers, to the people making these decisions about how to allocate resources, right? H how to invest, which neighborhoods to invest in, what to invest in, and also importantly, how to demonstrate that the investment is working, right? Because that's another thing that, that, uh, that those who, who, who make those investments want to be able to say is that, we basically made an investment in that, in, you know, an in infrastructure in that community, and look at the difference it's making, right? And so again, there's no way to get that data right now, and that's something that we're working really hard on, so that we can we can also evaluate the, the downstream effects. So, um, so yeah, we we hope you enjoyed our presentation today. Uh, it's Mark. I'm Nick. Uh, there's a number of other folks on the team who who aren't here tonight, but you can read more about the project here. We hope to be back, uh, maybe in one of your breakouts at some point, uh, because certainly we've got a, a lot of things that hopefully people are psyched about, and you know, we hope to join you again soon. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, guys. Sure. Cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you guys have thought about this. Uh, I just want to know what, what you found. Some of the infrastructure data that, that you're looking for uh, if you go to companies like Comcast and such, would they have something like that, or is it not comprehensive or complete, or yeah. would they not share? So that's a good question. I mean, I think uh, it, it, the long story short, there, well, there's, there's two short stories. One is that Comcast doesn't own all the infrastructure, uh, and the, sec the second part of this that is that even the infrastructure that they do own, they don't often have complete data on. So the fiber in the ground actually is is not all, not typically owned by Comcast. It's like Crown Castle or Zeo or some other some other company that basically uh, owns the fiber, and then Comcast will lease it from those companies. And so, uh, but it's a number of different companies, and so nobody has the complete picture of where everything is. Uh, it's certainly not as a public resource. Uh, anything that is known is private and incomplete. And then. Um, uh, I mean, I'll tell you a story of when, uh, part of why I got kind of interested in, in, in the data problem here is when I got my own home wired up here in, in Hyde Park, um, they rolled the truck to the neighborhood and they started doing this. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, I got to figure out where like the nearest, uh, you know, where the nearest head end, like the cable drop is. I'm like, don't you know? And they're like, no. We just, we just drive to the neighborhood and like look up at the pole. We, we assume there's one nearby. Turns out there wasn't. Okay, so uh, so it was pretty so pretty interesting. Uh, I mean, that's not to say that they don't have any data. They they certainly I'm sure they keep data about this because they've got subscribers. But uh, like any data set, it, it it's it's certainly not complete, and it's not public, right? Hi, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. And I also enjoyed the presentation yesterday at the DSI Summit. Okay. Um, but um, I was wondering, so this is 
obviously you're looking at a lot of data and information in this project already, but I was wondering if there you would also put any thought into looking at folks who access the internet via like smartphones or like some families and households likely only have smartphones or or essentially other other modes of access um, outside of just like a home uh, subscription service or broadband service? That's that's a great question. I mean, I, I looked to Mark and said, you want to answer that? So uh, I don't think we have a great answer for that yet. I mean, I think you're... I think your question is um, essentially there are a lot of homes that basically are households that rely on cell phone as a primary mode of internet access and so are you measuring, are you tracking that? And I would say that that hasn't been our focus uh, to date but um, that's not to dismiss it. That's, that's, I think it's a, it's a, a very important question and it's, it's certainly something that um, uh, with more people to help us we would be very excited to look into. Mark wants to yeah, so currently our software is, like, the way it's deployed is we have to have a fixed internet connection to measure. And, but yeah, I mean, obviously that's, like, somewhat limiting because there's a lot of people that use the internet through their phone. Um, we have talked a lot about trying to expand the software so that we can include, like, basically make it more software-based because right now we have hardware that we have to use and we've talked about or like toyed around the with the idea of like how could we collect similar measurements uh, but not, you know, kind of like get around the need for, you know, deploying hardware in a specific location. Um, and there are, I was going to say too, there are data sets like Ookla also produces data on mobile uh, broadband connections. But again, you kind of get the same issues with that as you do with the, the fixed internet connection data because like basically it's still very biased sample and then you also have the same issues with like Wi-Fi, people using their phone on Wi-Fi and, and being restricted by, by potential bottlenecks there, so. Yeah, you, you might be wondering too after hearing that like well, why did we go with this hardware-based solution and, 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 and part of the reason that we're, we're doing that and then of course, we maybe have to back away from that in some settings, is uh, as Mark alluded to, uh, a lot of the data sets that exist involve people measuring their Wi-Fi network, not their ISP. Uh, increasingly, especially as access speeds get faster and Wi-Fi access points get older, the Wi-Fi, home Wi-Fi is the bottleneck, but, but that is actually something that we didn't talk about today, but there's another, I think our next data story uh, will be about exactly that because in addition to the hardware piece there we we did deploy in some participants a browser plugin that measures the Wi-Fi speed so that we could see basically which is faster yeah on one of our slides we actually have the comparison right is that one yeah so there's an example of the yellow being the wired and the red being the Wi-Fi and so that's why we went with this particular like wired solution thus far so we could really get Comcast or RCN or what have you, but you, but but it does lead us into this this limitation of, as we think about phones and other things. Um, so a question about uh, how much access we need, and uh, I know the feds are. Th I think the feds are still stuck at 25 down and right. five megabits per second up. Three, yeah. uh, three, three meg. Three. Okay, yeah. uh, and they they call that adequate. And then um, uh, on the other hand, the folks at NYC Mesh. The folks that are building wire, uh, wireless networking out in New York City are t are talking about we need a hundred megabits yep. uh, uh, synchronous. I mean symmetrical, so uh, hundred megs down, hundred megs up, um, and 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 to, to take another look at it, you know yep. the Comcast and the uh, and the uh, AT and T's and the Verizon Fiber iOS are telling us well we really need a gig up and right. a really a gig down. And um, so, in your calculations, what did you come up with that a household needs? Well, so I, I, I would be careful to say that we probably haven't answered that comprehensively. Uh, we did look at that in the case of video conferencing, uh, and there's a data story on the site that talks about like the study and a, 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 and a published paper. It, it, you want to see the answer for video conferencing in more more detail. The answer there is is you know for video conferencing is that 25.3 might be okay if you're like living alone, uh, but the minute you basically have a few people, you know, zooming, uh, you know, at the same time as anything else going on, that it's, you know, the pandemic situation 
25.3 was probably not, not sufficient for most people. That's what this particular graphic is showing down here is that um, that's three. The shaded is like the three up. And, and you could see basically this is, I think, for uh, a couple, how many uh, does it say? Yeah. Zoom meeting. Yeah, Zoom meeting team. So this is like one conference call, two, and three, right? So immediately you get three Teams calls going, and you're, you're well above three. Uh, so um, we could have a longer discussion about 25-3, 50 50-50, but, but yeah, hopefully that is, is a start. Um, we have a question from the chat, from the live stream. Uh, does the research also look at the level of hardware availability in, e in each home, for example, if uh, there are four kids and only one device that makes it hard to do homework or access online classes? That's a good question. So uh, in this slide here in the lower left, you can see there's a plot called device count. Uh, so that's like the number of connected devices in the home. The survey, did we ask how many people live in the home? I, f I forget. I think so we have the number of people in the home and then we have the number of devices that are connected to the network at any given time. Okay, well, not every device is created equal. You know, your, 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 uh, your phone is probably a lot different than your 4K TV. You got 4K TVs running, you know, you got four or five of those going on at once, then that's a little different than some phones. Now, and I think when we showed the Tale of Two Gigs story to Comcast, um, they said, oh, that's really interesting. Well, what's going on? Like, what do those people have connected in the home? Are they like, are those, you know, they got like four TVs going on at once or what's actually happening there? How many people live there? How many people are connected? And we would love to be able to, to answer that question, but it goes back to that privacy trade-off, right? Because counting devices, uh, I don't know, anybody familiar with network technology? Okay, so, so like you can count the number of devices by looking at the ARP table, right? Um, okay, so long story short is, it's easy to count the number of devices on the network in a fairly non-invasive way. Um, once you want to figure out what the device is, you know, then you can, you know, there are ways to do it that are not super reliable. There are other ways to do it that are a little more invasive. And we just decided like, okay, that's, we're going to draw the line right there. We're just, we're, we're going to count the number of devices, but we're not going to get into like, what you've got connected to the network, because that starts to get a little bit invasive. And so, um, long story short is we, we don't know. Um, could we know? Yeah, we could. Maybe down the road, we'll do another study with the, with the subpopulation that, that where we do a little bit more in, invasive monitoring like that, but that's not where we wanted to start. Um, Isaac. I want to basically understand um, the problem. So the problem is a place like Hyde Park has way higher speeds, and a place like South Shore has lesser speed, correct? As far as the, on a metric, correct? Small sample, I guess that's the... Yeah, yeah. so yeah. I'm trying to, because what I see is this project, we're trying to gather, you guys are trying to gather data to show the people, like you said, you mentioned uh, up top, the where to allocate funds or, you know, to help. Right. So these devices that you currently have are gathering the data that we have right now, Correct. right? Okay, I have an idea. That's all I have to say. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, I think we have to be careful about talking about neighborhoods at this point uh, based, on the, based on the anecdotes we shared just because the sample size is so small. But that's where we want to go. I mean, that is the hypo Like, we looked at that and we were like, well, that's interesting. Like, it's time to get more data from these neighborhoods because it looks like there might be something there. So that is a hypothesis we continue to explore. Mark wants to. Yeah, I'll just add to that, too. Like, um, it's, it's tricky, especially in a place like Chicago, because if you look, like, right now or not too long ago, what the FCC was doing when they were distributing dollars to communities to build better internet infrastructure was they were using this survey data that ISPs submit and there's no actual performance data in there I mean they can say like we serve this block and we provide a maximum of a gig but if you like if you go on our portal we have like that data set on there and you look at like that data set and you go to Chicago 
there's like no distinct, there's no variety whatsoever across the entire city, right? And like what we're trying to do is say like, no, like actually there is, there is differences, there is disparity. It's just that right now the current data sets are not showing it. So that's why it's like, why we kind of emphasize what we're doing, especially in a city environment, because like you can look at other data sets and it's like, oh, everything's great. And that's what Nick was saying too, was like when he moved to Hyde Park, you know, he lives in the city, it's in U Chicago's backyard, you think like, oh yeah, they'd have great internet. They didn't even serve his house, you know, so so that's like kind of like the real, you know, gist of it. I see what you guys are doing. This is great because I'm pretty sure, you know, oh this service this neighbor, this service this neighbor, but they don't have like you said the data, they don't have the exact right. because if they do it would be more accurate, more precise. Right. We can, we can actually Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've got another question from the live stream chat. Uh, I guess this is also referring to the the difference in uh, the two communities. Uh, were households able to effectively use the internet in all the ways they wanted to without complaints, despite the performance differences? Uh, what additional value does e equal access add? Qu question I think is like. What, uh, you know, in the, in the tale of two gigs, uh, we saw that there was this disparity. But so for the lower, you know, performance level, were they still able to use the internet? Um, and like, yeah. who, and, and I said to people, I'm like, who cares if it's good enough? Like, right. You know, what, who cares if it's equal? Yeah, I mean, that's a fair, that's a fair point. I think in that story in particular, yeah, we're comparing two households that have gigabit service, which gigabit, I mean, if you're familiar with internet speeds, like that's probably more than anyone really ever needs unless you're downloading like massive data files every five seconds from the internet. So like, yeah, that particular case is like, even the person in South Shore who was experiencing less internet speed was still clocking like 800 megabits per second. And like, that's more than enough expect like currently but I think like the broader point we're trying to make with that story is that like one both household about both households are paying for the same internet service so shouldn't they be getting the exact same thing and you know you can kind of think of like the analogy like okay if I go to buy a Toyota Camry I should expect to get like the same car regardless of whether I buy that Toyota in like New York City or Los Angeles right so like that, I think that kind of is like one of the main emphasis of that story is just that like one, like why is there even a difference here? And then two, I think the other point is that like, yeah, we're looking at two, we're looking at two households that have gigabit service and that's like more than, you know, more than they might need. But, you know, when we start, like it kind of opens up the question, right? Of like, okay, well here we saw this difference with gigabit, but would we see the same difference with like a service plan like 30 megabits per second? And in that case, like, you know, discrepancy of even like five megabits per second can have a pretty big effect on the online experience of a household. So, so yeah, that's a fair point. I think, uh, you know, to add to, to Mark's comments too, I think one thing that's sort of uh, interesting about that story is that nobody actually knows what the cause of that difference is. Like, we don't know. Uh, the ISP doesn't know. They've, in fact, asked us. They said, did you ever find out what the, what the deal is there? Like, nobody knows. And so uh, in that case, yeah, it's, it so happens that may 800 versus 900 is probably fine, you know. But, like, the hypothesis here and sort of why we're going after more data diving in here is that that just showed up because we happened to look at two homes. And so if it's much like the personal experience I shared with you, I said, well, if it happened to me, it's probably happening elsewhere. Sure enough, we start to look, it's happening elsewhere. And hypothesis is, well, look, if you've got these discrepancies that exist in something that's supposedly the same product, and nobody even knows like why, first of all, that they differ, and also why they differ, nobody can explain it, then hypothesis is the harder we look, we're gonna start to see more of that, uh, and maybe in, cases, maybe in systematic ways, and also maybe in other cases that, that matter. Hey, folks. Uh, hey. 
great to see you guys. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I have two questions, one in the weeds and one high level. I'll throw them both out. You can choose which one you like best. Uh, at a really low level, I was wondering if you surveyed things like the modem hardware, if it were ISP provided, or you know, if it's doing double duty as a modem and a router, and if it's router, is it piping out the public signal from the ISP? Uh, and so I was just interested, like, before you even get to your device, are you looking at the pieces of the puzzle there? Um, I also wanted to ask at a high level, you know, there's a long and unsuccessful history of municipal broadband efforts that have been pretty effectively torpedoed by ISPs over the years. And I just wanted to ask if you had any kind of aspirationally, policy-wise, uh, interested in kind of reviving that discussion or pot potential thoughts on, on what municipal broadband could kind of do with the data that you're creating? Yeah, I, I'll turn it to Mark, but I, I will say that um, on the modem question, that was the first question the ISPs asked us. They were like, is there a difference in the modem or what's going on there? Because I think, as you point out, that is a plausible explanation. Um, and so one of the things we've been doing as we gather data is try to try to get information from uh, the study participants about the modem that they're using and the Wi-Fi router and so on and so forth. Uh, harder than you might initially think to get quality data on that. So, uh, but uh, let, let me turn it to Mark. He probably has a lot more to say on this too. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'll, I'll just echo what Nick said. We, we do try to collect that data. Um, we have a survey that we um, issue in, a, like in accompaniment to the device, um, but it is difficult to get accurate information on that. Um, a lot of people, I mean, I don't even know what my router is, you know, like if you ask me right now what my model is, I, I couldn't tell you. So I think like it's it's a difficult question, especially when you're just collecting this data from like, you know, um, people who are not working in this space. Um, but it's definitely something that we've considered because uh, it can have a pretty big effect. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's something that, you know, if we want to like go to an ISP and say like, hey, we found this discrepancy, that like that's probably going to be one of the things that they ask you about. It's like, okay, well, what was their, what was the equipment they're using? Um, so it's something we're thinking about. It's something that we really want to um, dig deeper into. Um, but, but right now, I think we're, we're still kind of trying to figure out how to best do that. Um, on the municipal broadband question, I don't know if I have a strong stance on that. One thing I'll say, though, is we are kind of a second part of our initiative that Nick mentioned at the end of the, pr the presentation is that we are trying to, you know, test alternative solutions. Um, and so we're collaborating with the Chicago Area Broadband Initiative to do some testing of some of their equipment. And, you know, I think part of that is just, like, expanding the solution set that communities can use and the tool sets that communities can use to provide better internet to their residents. So um, I think I could say we're probably pro any kind of you know, solutions that work for communities. Um, yeah. I think one of the, th one of the things in that, in that space too that's kind of, um, you know, we got a lot, a lot to learn and I think it, but it's a pretty exciting time because it sounds like you're familiar with community mesh networks and other things and that technology was not great for a long for a long time when people were trying to build it, but now, this you know with 60 gigahertz uh, radios and other things, it's like oh, there's actually stuff that's reasonably, you know, you and I probably wouldn't buy it, but reasonably affordable for property property managers and other folks, um, that actually doesn't suck, right? <laughs> and so I think it's this whole last. 500 feet or, or what have you. I mean, I think the technology in that range has gotten so much better in the last, just even the last couple of years that uh, I think it's going to be an exciting space to, to revisit. I mean, I, I, as you pointed out, some of those things failed not for technical reasons too. So I think it's, it's very interesting as we talk with the Chicago Area Broadband Initiative in particular, as they're thinking about, well, how do we sustain this, right? Do we work with a property manager? Do we roll it into rent? Do we you know, do we sell it to individual units, like et cetera, et cetera. And so that is not, I think, my area of expertise. Uh, one of uh, the people we work with, Nicole Marwell, works on uh, governance and organizations. And I think, uh, you know, certainly would have a lot more to say about that piece. But yeah, really interesting space. How exactly do you acquire data and how do you ensure it's most accurate or how do you verify its accuracy? 
So choir, you mean like how do we measure the network? Yeah. We actually we actually just use like um, basically like if you go to our GitHub page, um, you can look at the code. There's like two primary files, but basically all we do is we take executables. So speed like Ookla makes an executable a client or a CLI package that you can install, and then you just run it from the command line. And it just does like a speed test from the command line. And that's actually what a lot of our test is, is just like we just running commands from like a Python script and then parsing the data in the Python script and then we send it into like a data pipeline. Um, in terms of accuracy, that's probably a question for you, Nick. Yeah, I, I can take that. I mean, I think um, accuracy all depends on like what you're trying to measure and what you're claiming from the data. And I think one of the things that um, you know, I won't, uh, I won't talk about the whole 10 to 20 year debate on this, but speed test, right? It's like throughput. It's like how many, how many bits can I move across the network in a, in a, in a window of time? That sounds like an easy thing to measure, right? It's like, it's like zero to 60 or something, right? For a car or miles per gallon. But, uh, there, there are probably as many different ways to measure speed tests as there are speed tests. Because it's like, oh, well, the connection takes a while to warm up. Like, do I include that part? Or how many connections in parallel do I open at once? Or where am I measuring to? Am I measuring, like, to, um, you know, across the hall? Or am I measuring across the country, right? Or am I measuring to Google? And you're going to get different answers depending on how the, the decisions you make for each of those. And then people are going to, you know, so is it accurate? Well, it's accurately measuring something. Like, but do you care about the speed across the hall or do you care about the speed to Google? And then, you know, everybody argues about that, right? So, um, you have something to add? Yeah, actually, another thing I was just thought of this, too, is so we, when we measure speed, we actually do, right now we're doing three different speed tests. And two of them we run in sequence. So they're running approximately at the same time. And it's actually kind of a way to show, like, okay, if there's agreement between the three tests, then we can kind of say, like, okay, this is what the speed actually is. Um, but that's also kind of like a point to why we want the software to be open source so that we can have more people add tests. Because as Nick said, there's, like, a lot of different ways to measure this stuff. And, you know, we think that, like, if... A, like an accurate tool probably is going to mean a tool that uses a lot of different tools to measure the same thing and then see like, okay, are we getting agreement across those different measurements? All right. Uh, we're, we're good. Thank you. Uh, this Thank is you great. guys. So we're going to shift to the civic hacking portion of the evening.